So yeah, I was asked to uh, give a lecture on um, high energy physics methods in condensed matter. And I think the first thing I found out is there's, there's no such a thing. So there's just methods. And people use them all over the place. Um, and so I think the first, if you have to take just one thing out of this, is that um, the first thing is that you have to you know, be brave and open all kinds of books. You know, don't let the labels uh, you know, prevent you from opening this paper or this book because you, know, just, you just have to find a dictionary. And once you find a dictionary, it's all, it's all there. And I think the best, the best physicist knew everything. So, so I hope this lecture, even you know, if you don't get all the details, will kind of empower you to, to, um, to you know, dive into high energy uh, literature from condensed matter, and maybe you know, um, put your own creative mind there, and and also bring stuff from there, so that. We don't rediscover things all the time, which is what typically happens. Okay, so so yeah, so instead of methods, it's basically a collection of warnings and facts and some ideas that you might encounter in your life while uh, uh, studying essentially uh, vial and gapless states of matter. Um, that I'm going to rephrase as as Lorentz breaking theories, actually, uh, from high energy physics. And in fact, Lorentz breaking despite common knowledge, has been quite studied in, in high energy physics because people like to think about beyond the standard model and, and of course they, have, they need something to do. So. Um, so, and in fact, they're quite interesting because um, Lorentz symmetry is a very restricted symmetry. So, so what happens is that, is that it prevents a lot of ambiguities in theories, in fact. And so we're gonna encounter some examples of those ambiguities and for us, they're pretty important because they lead to, to observable quantities. So how, does, how do we fix them and what does this mean for, like in the high energy perspective, how does this translate to the, to the condensed matter, et cetera? That's gonna be, that's gonna be pretty much point two. So um, just, uh, just a word of warning, I'm not gonna be like extremely detailed because it's impossible to give like a quantum field theory course in like three hours. Uh, but so it's going to be more plausibility arguments rather than like technical derivations, and also I want to like a show of hands of how many of you have been exposed to quantum field theory or high energy physics before. Okay, okay, that's, that's okay. So maybe you should be giving the lecture. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, good. So I was going to say I was expecting less hands. So I was going to I'm going to start with a. Can I raise this now? Okay. <laughs> I was going to start with a, let's see, how many of you can diagonalize a 4x4 four four Hamiltonian? <laughs> good question, good question. Let's say with, with a computer. Okay, I hope, I hope everybody raised their hands. Um, so I'm going to write a 4x4 four four Hamiltonian, and whenever you're lost, look at this Hamiltonian and you'll be fine. Okay, so this is obviously a blackboard that bounces. So I'm going to write a lot of things here, so I'll, I'll explain this in a lot of detail in what follows. So don't worry uh, too much right now. Uh, okay, four by four Hamiltonian. What, is, what are these things? So one important thing here, sigma are the poly matrices two by two real spin, okay? K, we're three dimensions, more, like you can assume we're always going to be in three plus one is what, what people say in, in high energy, it's like time too. So this is the momentum. I'm going to take it as a continuous variable and some, at some point we will make it, we will make connection to the lattice. So this is kind of the opposite approach to all the lectures you've seen. It's, we're kind of going from the low energy to the lattice rather than from the lattice to low energy or just from, just, yeah, that's, that's what we're doing. So now it's convenient to define, so you notice I have a vector B that has three components and a scalar B0, yeah. Okay, you'll see what I mean. But what I mean is that at some point we will write a field theory and then we will, la we will kind of latticize it. That's what I mean by latticization. 
I don't know if this word exists, that's why it's on quotes. But there's like, if you write a field theory, there's like easy ways to just write a theory that's, that's periodic. Yeah, that's, uh, we'll go through that. Okay, so uh, yeah, so we have a three vector here, a scalar here, high energy physics, physicists like four vectors, so we're gonna write a four vector in this way. So mu is an index that goes from zero to three, and then I'll use, so I use Greek indices to, to note zero to three, so zero is usually time. And then uh, Latin indices to, to go from one to three, so, so just the uh, spatial indices would be Latin letters, that's a common convention. And some things that you, know, you will encounter in high energy papers is that you know, when you define this product, it's not exactly the, the vector product, it has some, some structure to it. In particular, you just have to put a minus sign to the spatial part. So I've defined, I defined a signature of the metric, if you want to call it that way. Um, I'm going to call M the mass. And this is not going to be equivalent to a gap, by the way. These are going to be two different things. And so, yeah, so this is my Hamiltonian. And I'm going to show that this Hamiltonian is actually a quite, like with this Hamiltonian, you can understand pretty much 90% of the papers in vial semi-metals that do not involve superconductivity, but well, maybe like if you, then you can generalize it and double it and so on and, and understand maybe 99%. Um, and then I'm gonna discuss some generalizations that will, that will uh, allow us to describe nodal lines and stuff like that. Okay, so, um, right, so, so this, so this uh, Hamiltonian acts in, um, you know, in a four by four space uh, with real spin. The other, the other degree of freedom I'm going to leave open. It depends on the system. I'm not going to say too much about it, but it's going to, this Hamilton is going to act on a kind of wave function that, I, that I'm going to write as, uh, in, you know, in case space, I'm going to write as, uh, so it's a four component wave function, and I'm going to write it as two, two component objects. Um, Actually, I should write to be precise here. This guy. The other one is just uh, just a vector. And um, and so the first thing um, before I go into like the details of how of why, what's the spectrum and so on, which we, you could already probably guess, um, I'll define some some notation. So one thing that um, well, okay. So so let's see. So I can write it in, in a um, kind of compact manner, this, 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 uh, this Hamiltonian, in the following way. So I'm just going to write some matrices that I would like to use. So these big gammas are just matrices that I'll define. But I mean, you, you can see the definition from there, actually. But OK, so in particular, gamma 0, for example, is, is just sigma 0 cross tau 1. So this is Kronecker product. Multiplies the mass, so it's kind of here. So you have to imagine that there's a big two by two one here. Okay, so far so good. And you know, likewise, you can define the other matrices. Gamma i is just sigma i cross tau three. Gamma five is just sigma zero cross tau three. By the way, I, I, I will provide lectures, so I lecture notes, so so feel free to just listen. And my IB can be written as cross tau zero and so on. So um, so this is one way to write the Hamilton in a in a easy uh, notation. One thing that you will encounter too in, in high energy is that instead of defining this object, people like to define uh, well, something that is called a Dirac adjoint for reasons that, that involve Lorentz invariance, actually, which is just simply this guy. So it's just you multiply this guy by, by your gamma zero and you're done. Um, and now uh, there is also the need, or I don't know, uh, it's a matter of choice, but but 
it's easy to go from, from the Hamiltonian language to the Lagrangian language, and I'll be using uh, the action language, and I'll be using that a lot. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rewrite this, this guy as an action uh, right now. So, okay, so this Hamiltonian is actually depends on k. It's an operator. I can define Hamiltonian density in 3D, let's say. So schematically, something like this. And now what I want to do is define the Lagrangian as essentially like Lagrangian density somehow uh, as omega minus h of k. And what I want to do is I want to write in a funny way. I want to, uh, you know, since most of the high energy literature is written like this, I'm going to connect to this by just uh, using the fact that this matrix squared is just the identity. So I just write that. So I just, I can write, you know, I can multiply this guy by the identity, no problem. So I'm going to use one of them to put it right here, the other one to put it right here. And I can define now this guy, which is, I'm going to call the action. And now you know this, this is just uh, what I call the Dirac adjoint. And now I can try to see what, what the hell is this object. Well, yeah, omega is PQ. What do you mean PQ? Yeah, so omega is just the frequency. It's just the zero. So if I write a four vector, which I will write now, it's just like the energy. It's just the energy. I, can, I could call it E if you want. I'm just, I'm just writing a generalized momentum incorporating the energy and the, and the k, so. <laughs> be. Like from, you know, doing derivatives of this action will give you like the Schrodinger equation position. But, okay, so. Um, okay, so. Um, so now. I can use um, I can use this this um, this compact notation to write this in a kind of neater way. So what what this gamma zero is going to do is going to it's going to redefine all my all my uh, big like capital gammas here. That's just what it's going to do. So the so the redefinition like basically gamma zero and this guys are basically the the we call them the Dirac matrices, and they're represented by by some you know, uh, small gamma. So there are four of them, and there's and there I can define also gamma five, which actually you you can check that it's the same as the big gamma five, and gamma zero is actually the same as gamma zero. So, so I can rewrite this action in a more compact way using this, this also this uh, four product here. And, you know, I, I guess I can leave it as an exercise, but if you cannot do it, you can ask me. So, whoops. Uh, so, in a way, I wrote the Schrodinger equation. Basically, you can imagine like you know, writing the Schrodinger equation here, and uh, you know the e now instead of going with the identity it goes with this gamma zero because I did this trick. So I can uh, write it in a very compact way by contracting with this gamma mu's that are just gamma zeros times the, times the times the other matrices, and so you can check that well the mass goes with gamma zero, so it now goes with the identity and so on. And so I can write uh, this, this term, which is gonna be very important. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna write this theory here because we will use it a lot. So, okay, I think you can remember that, the, that K is the momentum, so I'm gonna erase that. So just remember this is exactly the same theory as this one. So if you're lost in that notation, just remember that this, this thing is the same. 
So it's just a matter of you know writing somehow in a compact way things. Okay. Very good. And so one important thing. Uh, Let's see. One important thing that this, so this gamma five matrix is actually quite important. Uh, it, you can also check that it's a product of all other gamma matrices, like gamma. So it's basically gamma zero times gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, and it's. Uh, well, some people put an I, but but that's that's fine. So it's a product of all gamma matrices, and and since it's a product, actually, it anti commutes with all of them. So this is so this is important an important property. So I'm going to put this here. I'm at zero. Okay. And now, okay. So I introduced a bunch of notation, but now let's see what what we can do with this theory because this theory actually can interpolate from an insulator to a Dirac semi-metal to a vial semi-metal depending on the value of, the, of all these parameters. So I'm gonna show that. And that's, that's pretty powerful because then, you know, you can, you can understand how a vial semimeter responds to an electromagnetic field by coupling this to an electromagnetic field. You can understand arcs by making this uh, parameters vary in space. So, so there's, there's a lot that you can do with this simple Hamiltonian or the simple action. Some of the things I mentioned I'm not gonna do, but, but just to say that this, this is, Quite powerful. Okay, so, so I'm going to erase this. So, questions so far? You please interrupt me, of course. Okay. So, right. So the Schrodinger equation now looks a bit funny, but but it's just me. It's the it's the same. So basically, you know. And write it as something like this. And so you can solve for, you know, there's an E here, so you can solve for, for eigenvalues. And okay, it's a four by four matrix, so it has four bands. So let's let's try to find some easy limits and give give them some names. So the rack. I'm going to call it massive Dirac because so I'm going to set all components of this four vector to zero, and I'm going to choose the mass to be non-zero. So that what does this give? That just gives this, right? So what is this? This is just a Dirac massive Dirac Hamiltonian, right? We know how the spectrum looks. It's just two bands. I mean, you can, you can notice that I haven't put uh, like Fermi velocities or anything like that. I'll do that later. But let's just focus on this first. Um, right. So, so this case is just very simple. It's uh, two g degenerate bands with a gap that two m. So these are you know doubly degenerate. So they're they're. You know, fall on top of each other. True. Okay. Doesn't matter which k I plot because it's isotropic. Um, okay. So this is this is an, what we would call in condensed matter an insulator. So that's good. So this this Hamiltonian has an insulator in it when m is uh, is non-zero and b is zero. Okay. Now now we can we can. Look at another limit. I'll yeah. So yeah. So let's call a vial limit. So in this context, I'm using vial as in the high energy, but in the in the high like in the condensed matter community, I guess this would be called a Dirac semi middle. But it's you know it's a vial it's actually a vial equation or Hamiltonian in in high energy physics. So on that. Okay. 
So this, you can already guess, it's making m equals 0, b mu is 0. So all, I'll, all I'm left with is this diagonal block, so plus minus. Right. So now we notice, of course, that uh, this Hamilton is, is very symmetric um, because it's block diagonal. And we call that symmetry the Carroll symmetry. But this is not the Carroll symmetry that we've been hearing about. It's a different symmetry, just to make things even more confusing. Um, I guess one reason, like one, if you just want one reason why, why this symmetry is different is that this is a continuous symmetry, while, while the symmetries that have been introduced as Carroll symmetry is, are discrete. So this symmetry says the following thing. It's a, it's a transformation, obviously. And it looks a lot like a gauge transformation where you would you know, add a face to this, to this uh, spinner, but, but actually it comes with a gamma five matrix. So this is, this is a parameter that I used to describe the symmetry. And it comes with a gamma five on top. And in fact, the psi bar has the following transformation. So this is true because, so you notice that there's no minus here. And this, the reason is the gamma zero, that it will have a minus, but then one, once I commute with the gamma zero, it, it kills a minus. Okay, so now I can, I can ask what happens if I, if I uh, you know, I have, I have this, this Lagrangian, and I, and I ask whether is it, is it invariant, okay, we, we said the B to zero, is it invariant to this symmetry? Like, is it, does it stay the same when I apply this? So let's do it. Now, the first term, the K doesn't care, so I can write, let's see, the I theta halves come out five, K mu, gamma mu. Okay, so this is the transformed one. Now, if I look at the first term, the gamma five, I told you anti-commutes with this guy. So it's gonna acquire a minus sign and it's gonna kill this guy. So this term is, is okay. So this term is invariant under that, that symmetry. But this guy has no gamma five. So it's actually not invariant. So this M breaks Carroll symmetry. So what, is, what this M is doing is actually coupling the two Carroll Hamiltonians, which are this diagonal part. And so if M is zero, we can define a, a, you know, a, 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 the eigenstates of this gamma five will, uh, will be also the eigenstates that diagonalize these guys. So I'm gonna define those I guess here. And of course, there, I already erased it, but I told you that I was working in, a, I already called them anticipating this. Anticipating this fact, I chose a basis where this fact is really uh, apparent. This is called the Carroll basis for, for this reason. And so I can define simply by inspection that, that I can transform a Dirac spinner into a vial spinner. Yeah. Yeah, so M is not zero in this, from this part of the line. So to the right side of the line is M is zero. Well, okay, not here, but. <laughs> but okay, so. B to zero, yeah, B, B is always zero so far, yeah. Sorry, so, so I just wanted to say that M was not invariant under this transformation, so that's why I make it zero, so that, so that I can define this, guys. Um, because now, so we say that this, ha this, um, this two, two by two wave functions have a definite chirality, because they're eigenstates of gamma five. And these guys are, Called the projectors. So, so this this object here projects um, projects 
uh, the four by four spinner into the something that's two, four by four, but it only has either right or left. Okay. So in fact, I mean, this is quite easy to see because in this basis, gamma five is just minus one, one. So once I add the identity, I just select one of the two components of this, of this four by four object. And when I say one by one, I mean something like this. Okay, so, uh, so, okay, so now we've defined chirality as you know, eigenstates of gamma five, essentially. Um, one side note is that you might hear, yeah. Oh, but this, this is just how you implement symmetries. You choose a, a parameter. I think there's a how, but but a, la, a, a why. So sigma what? Oh, just you want you want to do like this to gamma five? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But okay. I guess the reason I do this, okay, besides from all the historical background and so on, the, the <laughs> yeah. So this this parameter is actually or changes in this parameter would actually mean something at some point. I'm not sure, I don't, I don't think I'll cover that, but, but in fact, uh, well, okay, let's say, let's say this, this has some physical information to it, just like when you, when you, uh, when you do a, just the normal U1 transformation in, in a theory and you impose conservation of that charge. You would find like your laws of conservation of charge. So this, 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 um, this continuous symmetry, um, you know, by Noether's theorem has also some implications in terms of conserved currents. And so it's important to allow that because you, if not, you would be missing all that, that information, I guess. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I was going to say that, that um, you might have heard that there's something called elicity as well. So elicity and chirality are not the same thing. They're just the same thing in the massless limit. Okay, so this kind of completely outside, so I can put in a box, but, and I'm not going to go in, into that, but elicity is defined, so H, small h, is defined as actually a two by two matrix. So that, that's already a difference. Um, P is momentum. And it's the projection of the spin along the, the momentum component. And this itself changes under Lorentz transformation. So it's actually like if you, if you know, an observer can see a different orientation of the spin depending on the, on the reference frame, unless that particle is going at the speed of light, which means it's massless. So, but this is just a side note, just to, just to uh, because this is, sometimes confused even in books, so, so I, I kind of, I want you to know that this, this, there is a difference. But okay, so elicity equals chirality only if m is zero. Basically you can write, you can, so if mass is non-zero, you can write this guy as, as uh, a superposition of states with with a defined elicity, that's what, that's what I mean. Okay, so after this side note, um, I can, yeah, so now, now I'll, I'll talk a bit about, so I, I talk already a bit about symmetry here. Um, but, okay, let's see. So I guess I can erase the outline here. Now, if I think, um, you know, one would say, okay, I, I, I like this Hamiltonian to describe vile semi-metals because this is gapless, it has a spectrum like this, you know, it has like the two, the 
two, uh, the two Hamiltonians kind of fall on top of each other. I like this. Why, why don't I use this? Okay, so this is, this is a direct semi-metal. And the reason I, I, don't, I don't want to use this to describe a vial is because these two copies actually uh, can talk, and they can talk through the mass term, as I said. And the reason this is not protected is because the mass term doesn't break any discrete symmetry, like time reversal, for example. So if you, if you take the time reversal operator that has been defined many times, uh, and you, well, I can actually write it. In this case, it would be this guy. And you apply it to this thing, you would see that the mass doesn't break any, any of that. And it doesn't break inversion either. So in principle, it's allowed by discrete symmetries. So, uh, and chiral symmetry is not, it doesn't really have to be preserved in, in, in nature, and, not, and, and even less in crystals. So, so no, sorry, in, it doesn't have to be uh, preserved at this level. Forget about the crystal. And um, so, so now it means that, that there's nothing that protects me to add a mass term. So in fact, these two guys can actually talk. So I want to do something that, that uh, makes them more stable. And this is the role of this vector B. So this is going to separate them in momentum space. And here is where we're going to break. Uh, we're going to break. Lawrence invariance, actually. Okay, so three. Uh, I don't have a good name for this one, so I'm just going to say the parameters. M equals zero. But then I'm going to choose a space like B, which just means that I choose the time component zero and some, some B. Uh, so this is completely space-like. Okay, so now how does, the, how does the spectrum look? So the Hamiltonian is just k minus b sigma minus k plus b sigma, right? Right, so what I'm doing is I'm shifting the two, the two uh, chiralities by a vector b, so my spectrum just looks like this. where this separation, so this is energy, this is kz, or yeah, I guess I chose them, let's say, let's say I, I choose this to be 0, 0, bz, so this would be 2bz. Okay, so I'm separating the two vials in momentum space. And so now you can ask, so I'm going to call the vial not separation this, in general it would be would be this, so delta of big K. So now you can ask, is this now, isn't this now better? And in fact it is because, you know, even if I add a small mass here, let's say I add a small mass, and by small, I, I'll define what I mean by small in a second. Like, by now, let's just choose it way less than, than B squared. What do you think this guy is going to do? Is it going to open up a gap here or something, or, or is it going to do something else? Moving K. Sorry? Moving K. moving K? No, because moving K would mean to change. Well, they, they would move. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. But actually, the, the, most, the most drastic feature is actually that the, that the, there's a small hybridization of these gap, of this, of this bands. And the reason I said yes, that they move in K, is because now the, if you compute the distance, it would be something that looks like this. 1 minus m squared b squared. So you see this theory, you know, if m is small, this is great because, you know, it opens up a gap, it moves them a bit closer, but, you know, if m, you know, if B uh, becomes larger than M, this kind of becomes imaginary, so. So smaller, sorry, smaller than M, then becomes imaginary. So then how can a momentum space separation be imaginary? Um, and what happens is basically that at that point, 
you open up a gap. And so the, the vital node separation doesn't, don't, doesn't make sense anymore. And so this theory knows about all this. And, and now we are in position to know how the spectrum evolves as a function of parameters. So you can actually play with this very easily in Mathematica, but so now what happens is, you know, I can start with b non zero spatial b n equals zero, and I have this. Now I start increasing m, and oops, I get this. And at some point, and this these guys just move towards each other. So this is m smaller than b squared. And now at some point, actually when m equals m squared equals b squared, the vial nodes annihilate. So this is kind of the only way I can gap out uh, a vial system, just by annihilating the, the two nodes. The reason is that they're, as we heard from Evo, they're monopoles in momentum space. So, so you can only annihilate them by pairs. And then as I increase m further, I'll just have this guy. And finally, if, if b is 0 and m is non-zero, I'll, I'll go back to the Dirac, Dirac spectrum. So this guy can interpolate all the way from a vial semi-metal separated hybridized band to an insulator. And if both m and b are 0, then you have what you would call a, a Dirac. So this is a Dirac. Semi-metal. Say ideal vial. And anything in between. With that simple Hamiltonian, four by four. And the good news is that this has been studied, like we've connected to some th this Hamilton to some theory that has been studied in, in other contexts. So we can borrow many of the results and actually find interesting things. I think that's, that, that would be my next lecture. But um, now I haven't, mentioned, I haven't mentioned this B0 yet. So B0, you know, if, I look, if I look just at, at one of these blocks, B0 is just it goes with the identity. So this, Actually, I might call it sigma zero or something. So sigma zero and one, like the identity in two by two is the same thing. So sigma, so this, this actually enters like a chemical potential, but unlike the chemical potential, it enters with different signs at different nodes. So a different, so this, there's a minus sign here. So then what this does is generically shifts the nodes uh, up and down in energy. So for finite, so when B0 is not 0, if I take this situation, well, let's actually, let's take this situation. Just to exaggerate a lot, I'm going to have something like this. You know, we'll, this is going to be proportional to B0, and this is going to be proportional to the B. So I'm going to separate, it, separate them in energy space uh, by B0 and in momentum space by B. Now what's a, like, how do I know like which values the parameters give me what? So here's the, here's the rule. The vial node separation in energy and momentum space, so that's what this mu means. Zero means energy space, one, two, and three means momentum space, is the following object. Two times B mu, one minus m squared, b squared. OK, so this, as long as this, yeah, let me, uh, where is this? Which, 
is I'm going to call define p squared is bigger than m squared. This is gapless. Okay, so this is the condition. So this b squared now is the four vector squared. So this is this object. So it includes b zero, which means that in particular, if I only have b zero, the system is always gapped because it's we are always in this case. You can check that explicitly. So for example. So if I take if I take space B zero M non zero but B zero non zero, the bands would gonna look like this. Which in fact looks a lot if you look at the uh, tellurium there are actually uh, it looks like this. And here's your vial and here's your vial and this is the vial node separation. Spectrum is gapped. But, but there's some vials here. Unless I dope it, I cannot access them. Okay. So I think this is a pretty awesome model. I made a career out of this. <laughs> um, that doesn't mean much, but <laughs> it's, it's important to me, I guess. Um, so now let's talk about, about a bit more about symmetries of these objects, the B and the B0, which is what I left, what I'm left with. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it here. Symmetries. I consider it spectrum. I consider symmetries. Okay, so one. This object, how does it behave under time reversal symmetry? Like, if I include this, is this Hamiltonian time reversal invariant or time reversal breaking? And you don't have to do any calculation to see this, actually. So how does it couple? Like, eliminate everything, how does it couple? It couples like this, right? You've seen this coupling before. It was in Evo's lecture. This is like a magnetic field. In fact, it's like a magnetization because it's an intrinsic property of the system. So B actually breaks time reversal, but preserves inversion. So adding B meaning breaks time reversal symmetry, preserves I. As I said, not many calculations, it's all hand wavy. But you can explicitly check this, obviously. Now, B0, how does it couple? Well, I, it couples like, it couples with the identity matrix, so that's like a chemical potential. So what does a chemical potential break? It preserves, definitely preserves Universal symmetry, but it breaks inversion in this simple model. So meaning when I separate the vial, so core message, like when I separate the vial nodes in energy, I'm breaking inversion in this model. When I separate them in momentum space, I'm breaking time reversal. If I do both, I break both. So this term, so this part of the Hamiltonian preserves time reversal symmetry and inversion, and with this term, I'm breaking both of these. Now, Lorentz symmetry, finally. I mean, I'm assuming you've all, all been exposed to, at some point in your undergrad, to Lorentz invariance. Uh, so I'm just gonna appeal to that knowledge, and a very basic one. So 
Lorentz imagery relies on kind of invariance under uh, frame transformations. And this B mu is a vector in space time. It points there. So it's a preferred orientation. So you already have to, like, at least intuitively agree with me that this looks like a Lorentz breaking term. In fact, it's a bit, it's a bit more subtle because what we don't learn in, in, in undergrad is that there, well, you can define two types of Lorentz transformations when, it, when they're called observer particle transformations, which is what you all kind of have intuitive in your mind. You change coordinates and your equations of motion kind of look the same in this new coordinate frame. And then you can define particle uh, transformation, uh, which in fact have an extra, extra addition to that, which is I transform everything, but some things remain unchanged. And so I'm going to illustrate this with a simple example. And so let's say you have a box, and you have a particle in this box, and there's a, some gravitational field, for example. And now I'm going to, so, so this is my box. I'm going to draw it here like dashed because I want to do something to it. Now, I, I can, so rotations are part of the Lorentz group. So I can rotate the box. But if I don't rotate the Earth, I don't preserve my equations, right? Because G would still be going this way. So what I did here is a particle trend. It's a particle rotation. So I'm not, I'm leaving G invariant, and this chooses a preferred direction. So this is what B does. So in this example, I can rotate the Earth. But if B is a property of my vacuum, a magnetization, so it's a spontaneous breaking of some symmetry, then I'm not allowed to rotate it, actually. So it actually prefers, so magnetizations break Lorentz invariance because they point somewhere. So, so if this force that I'm drawing here comes from the vacuum, then like from, from the, the, the actual state that I'm trying to describe, then I cannot, I, I cannot, I'm, not, I'm not allowed to rotate it. But in fact, this theory does preserve the fact that you know, if, you, if you kind of rotate everything, then it's obviously, obviously going to remain invariant. But if I don't rotate B, that B, which G in my example, then then I'm, uh, then I'm going to break it. So that's, that's the way this, this, um, this um, B breaks Lorentz invariance. Uh, yeah, so basically I'm, I'm just assuming that this B is going to remain fixed once I do the Lorentz transformation. It's kind of like when you, um, you know, when you have a particle in, in, in a magnetic field and you make a boost, then you might see in another frame that there's an electric field and a magnetic field. There, you're transforming the fields too. But what I'm saying is that if that's a magnetization, you don't you don't do that. That's that's all I'm saying. So you know, stick with the example of the of the Earth, and you will be fine. So there will be like in the notes, there will be some comment about this, and I guess some references if you are, if you are like really in, into defining all types of Lorentz transformations. It's not it's not a great great thing, but okay. So for our purposes, this B breaks uh, Lorentz symmetry. Okay, so I've said all this. Actually, how am I doing on time? Do you have another five, five, ten minutes? Okay. Five, ten, okay. Okay, this I'm going to keep. Um, and I'm going to, so, yeah, so if you have any questions, this is a good time to ask them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so here, I mean, you could, you could say that, you know, you could project your Hamiltonian to the, to the wild cones and you would have chiral symmetry. And in this subspace, they would not be coupled. Yeah, yeah, so I guess that's the answer. Okay, so. Um, okay, we will, we'll be talking about, yeah. Yeah, 
That's what I mean. That's observer. Yeah. Yeah, you don't transform this vector. Exactly, yeah, because it's a property of my vacuum. That's the, yeah. That's kind of the, usually, you know, particle and observer are the same thing because you transform everything. But here, I want to make a difference. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a bit, you know, that's not typically in textbooks because you always, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I guess that's the point of these, yeah, that's a side comment. Like, this is the point of this lecture's, I'm using many things that are actually in textbooks, and I, I think it's better just to, you know, uh, explain some stuff that are not, that is, you know, you cannot find really that well in, in textbooks. Um, especially like Lorentz breaking theories are typically not treated, but they're really important to us. So, right, okay, so coupling, coupling to, to uh, an electromagnetic field. How do you do this? Well, minimal substitution. K goes to E times A. A is the vector potential. In general, you would do this. You know, and you can define your field strength. I'm not sure if I'm going to use it, but just to remind you. And you know, the components of this guy would be the electric field, the magnetic field, and so on. So I'm saying this because now I can, I can you know, uh, add this substitution here, this minimal substitution here, and I can define an action that depends on A. By the way, Feynman uh, wrote this as K slash. So sometimes I'm going to use this. It just means that gamma mu is, uh, you know, dotted with whatever vector. So in, in this notation, k slash, b slash, gamma five. You can see the use of that. And now e is just like the coupling to the electromagnetic field is just uh, a slash, right? Okay. So, um, so now, so the reason I do this, besides I'm going to calculate some, some observables later, is that note that this, these two things are not very different. One is coupling to, if I write this term in all its full glory, it will look like this. And this guy, so this, this is this, and this guy is, Something like this. So they're not that different. It's just the gamma five, right? It's just that, th that this B distinguishes chiralities. That's why, that's why all the signs are different. This sign is different in the different chiralities, and this, this sign is different. That's what the gamma five does for you. It distinguishes chiralities. So it's kind of, it's really tempting to define something that's called a chiral gauge field, which is A5. And even though you might be tempted to do this, there are very important differences why this A5 is not the, is not the same as the B. I mean the A5 that the high energy physics, physicist would use. The reason is that A5 is a gauge field. Well, B mu is an observable. It's actually, as I said, it, if, you, if you think about the spatial components and magnetization, I can measure magnetization. Well, this guy, I can do gauge transformations. I can, I can do many things to make it ambiguous. So, and that has very important consequences. In particular, if you want me to name one, is that there's no chiral magnetic effect, and we'll, we will see that yeah, at some point. Uh, and so if you, if you treat this like an A5, then, you know, the, the temporal component of this is actually a chemical potential rather than a parameter in a Hamiltonian. And this has physical consequences. But just to say, just a word of warning, they look very, they look similar. But you have to always remember that one is parameters in your Hamiltonian, and the other one is coupling to some external field. And this, this will make a difference. OK, so I think I'll say this, and then I'll, I'll stop. So generalizations of Lorentz. Lorentz breaking theories. 
I need a G here somehow. <laughs> Lawrence generalizations? No. Okay. Sorry. I'll think about it. Um, so, of course, this is not the only term I can write that breaks Lorentz uh, uh, invariance. There are many, and people have thought about many of them. One very, like, simple one is, okay, you know what? I have Fermi velocities in my theory. Why not, why not include them? So I can write a, matri a matrix that I don't know really why, but I'm going to call M, big M. Uh, I could call it big V or something, but, you know, this. So this M, if it's only incorporating Fermi velocities, it would be a diagonal. So M is like diagonal of 1 minus Vx minus Vy minus Vz. And so that when I do this multiplication out, uh, it will correctly add a Vx to the K and so on. Um, but this is really not a big deal because I can kind of nearly always uh, rescale the Ks to, to incorporate the Vs when I'm calculating stuff, so it's not a big deal. Actually, we'll see an example of that. And in fact, chirality is, like if you want to know if, you know, if you set M to zero and so on and, and you want to ask what's the, what's the chirality, you just have to calculate the, the sign of the determinant of of M, and then this would give you the chirality of, so basically what before was this minus and this plus. Um, but, but in fact, there, there are other things I can do. For example, I can promote this M. So as I said, we were always working with a four by four Hamiltonian. So how many four by four matrices are? So there are 16, right? So, so I'm gonna promote M to, I'm gonna call it M twiddle to something that looks like this. Like this is the most general mass term you can write that breaks Lorentz invariance in the way I described before. Uh, actually, I always forget, stupid. M5, comma five, plus, plus M, M, actually. So this object here, okay, so this is the way uh, one constructs all matrices in, in all four by four matrices. So I already, you already know five, there's gamma zero, uh, three gamma i's, and gamma five, right? So these are five. So. So M, oh, or M the identity, of course. So, so the identity, I use the matrix, the, the mass, which we already had. I can also write a M5 mass, which is gamma five. Then gamma zero and gamma I, I, I can write another vector. But know that this vector, I can absorb in a redefinition of the fields. If I, if I write, if I write uh, the, so this guy is kind of irrelevant because I can, do this. Uh, e, A, mu, X, mu. And if you plug this in here, you can absorb this term in the definition of the field. So this is not really important. Another way of seeing this is that if I'm going to couple it to the gauge field, I can reabsorb it in the gauge. This one is the one we already have. So these are another four. So we had uh, how many? We had three, four, five, six. We had six, four, and now we have this guy, which is some uh, second rank tensor contracted with the sigma mu nu, which I defined as i over two commutator of gamma mu gamma nu. So this obviously vanishes when mu is equal to nu, so there are six independent, and it's anti-symmetric, so there are six independent matrices, and there are 16, okay. So 16 matrices. So you can do a similar game with, uh, you know, writing here a very general, let's say, G mu nu, and like write other other 
generalizations of the gamma matrices in a similar way. Uh, I'm not going to talk about any of that because this is already going to give a lot of um, like nice, nice properties. But just keep in mind that that in fact terms like this, if you diagonalize the Hamiltonian, just you add you add them here, you will see that they lead to nodal lines, for example. So nodal lines can also be incorporated in this formalism by adding terms like this. And actually, there's a paper by Burkov and so on that that they do this. I mean, they never call it Lorentz breaking and so on, but they write this kind of general mass term and they start playing around with, with how many phases do I have. Just the same as I did, but with kind of more general mass term. So yeah, so this is, this is kind of, uh, so if you dig deep, deep enough, you will find that people have studied these guys, but we will, we will focus on this. Okay, I think I'm gonna stop here and uh, take any questions and thank you. Yeah. No. No, 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 no. So you would make the mass change sign. Let's say, like, if I put B0 and B0, like, all, leave all the Bs to 0. And now I, ch I, I have a Dirac Hamiltonian. And if I change the mass, the sign of the mass of a Dirac Hamiltonian, I'm going to find a localized state. So it's like in this picture, it's always localized state at the interface, obviously. Um, now in this picture, the TI is always defined in, in terms of a relative uh, sign change of the mass. So I would have to promote this mass term to be space dependent. And then I would have, then I could describe a TI. Yeah, and in fact you can describe, with this theory you can describe many like interfaces of vials with TIs, but just letting everything depend on, on position, on, on, yeah, on position, essentially. You go to, yeah, real space, whatever you go to, have to real space, but, but other than that, you just make the B space dependent, the M space dependent, and you see how they interplay, and you can, you can, yeah, I can tell you more about that.